Beetlejuice. <laughs> Have you seen the new one? Mm -hmm. Hi everybody, I'm Diana Palm. Welcome to another episode. Today we're going to be talking about more things spiritual, UFO related. We're going to be talking also about the Super Soldier program and some other topics that are very interesting. Today I'm here with Alex. If you watched my episode last week, you would have been introduced to SALT. Um, she came on, and if you haven't seen that, I will link this video so you can get to know her and hear some of her fascinating stories about the quantum field here around Sedona, things that are going missing, like big Humvees and then coming back, UFOs, abductions, all of that stuff. So be sure you watch her video. So this is Salt's counterpart, Alex, who goes by Firefox, and she did refer to him in her video, but I thought it'd be really nice to bring him on because he has a lot to share, a lot of personal experiences and a lot of expertise. So welcome, Alex. Oh, thank you. Pleasure <laughs> being here. Thank you. So first, so you go by Firefox. Yes, it was a necessity back then, four years ago. The tour guides had almost a weird sense of pecking order and they gave other tour guides nicknames and I didn't want that. Who knows what they would have picked. Yeah. So <laughs> I cut them off at the pass, went to the reservationist and told them my nickname is Firefox. It's actually a variation of my soul spirit animal, which is a red fox. But I said, no, people will probably think of the, that comedian guy, Red Fox. Oh, he's passed away, but also shows how old I am. So I went, well, I was a firefighter in the Air Force, so Firefox. Okay, I'll go with Firefox. Sounds like I'm named after a browser, but it's better than <laughs> So I told the reservationist, here, Firefox. Too late, they couldn't do anything. I said, it's good, I was safe. <sighs> but uh, well, my other nickname, actually it was given to me by the Divine. They were so happy I finally realized that I should be using it, but uh, it is Malu. It's a Hawaiian word that means peace, serenity, calming. Of course, it's a Hawaiian word. If you translate in English, it'll mean just about everything. So it's Malu? Malu, yeah. Malu. Malu. And as you can tell by his voice, he actually does have a very soothing, calming tone. Um, it's going to be really amazing on your podcast. Oh, yes. Yeah. You know, even when I was a massage therapist for almost 20 years, my clients preferred that I talked during the session yes. where most people are just very quiet and playing maybe very calming instrument of music. Yeah. They said, no, they want me to talk. Yeah, sometimes there's a certain tone of voice and you definitely have it that's just so soothing. It almost lulls you into relaxation. Um, and we're gonna talk about that because I want you to tell everybody like about your history, about your military experience and, and kind of what kind of services you offer here in Sedona, and they can talk about your um, the Jeep tours that you take people on oh, with yes. salt and mm -hmm. all of that. So I'm gonna step out of the camera so that uh, Firefox can talk directly to you. Please be sure that you, ha if you have questions for him, put them in the comments below and um, we'll try to keep up with those or make more content about those to address your questions that you have. Oh, sounds good. Okay, awesome. <laughs> uh, I'm an experiencer because I've had so many experiences. I remember when I was about four or five years old, oh, I would tell my parents what I was experiencing. My mom would just pat me on the head and go, oh, you have such a vivid imagination. And I looked at her and I go, no, there's something in my room and I can't sleep. And then she would scold me. She would say, stop watching scary movies. And I'd look at her and go, it's not a scary movie, it's in my room. <laughs> so I gave up talking to them about this. I tried telling my friends, we're the same age, maybe we're having the same experiences. And then my friends made fun of me. No, I just kept to myself. But I never forgot about what those experiences were. And it stayed with me the whole time. And when I finally got into the military, I dabbled in dream work and tarot cards. Then it was all uphill from there. Um, I finally got around to learning massage therapy, then Reiki. I was a Shtanga yoga instructor for a short time. 
hypnotherapy uh, from the IHF, the International Hypnosis Federation. And just recently, uh, tagging along with SALT on her QHHT techniques. But the shamanic practices that I learned, uh, it was from Michael Harner's organization. Michael Harner was an anthropologist and he traveled the world in the 1960s to learn the spiritual practices of the indigenous people. He found a commonality between all of it. If you pull out all the cultural specific things out, there's a commonality between all of it and it doesn't matter where they come from, Australia, Africa, parts of Europe, Asia, even in the Americas, North, Central and South. So it's been around for 30,000 years. It's always evolves with the modern societies of the time. So that's where I got, uh, well, my te I had one teacher from Spain, one teacher from Mexico. I'd like to start with one of your childhood experiences. Before we started filming, we were chatting, and you were yes. telling me when you were like eight or nine years old, something uh, weird came in oh, your room. Oh, yes. Uh, I was about eight years old. I remember waking up in bed, and I wanted to roll over, and I couldn't. And then I tried the other way. Then I tried moving any part of my body, and I couldn't move. Uh, that started to scare me. And then I saw this shadowy figure just circling my bed ever so slowly, just a shadow. And then I tried calling out to my mother, but no voice came out. That scared me more. And all of a sudden I blacked out. And then when I woke up again, that shadow figure was on me. It was like a vampire just sucking my blood or sucking my energy right out. And of course that made me even more scared. I couldn't move, I couldn't speak. And then finally, something switched and I got mad. And I was so angry that I couldn't do anything about it. And then that anger actually was breaking the paralysis I had. And my arm slowly moved and I knew exactly what to do. I was gonna strangle this thing and show him he couldn't do this to me. And the more anger I got, the easier it was to move. And just when I had my hands, I could see my fingertips disappearing into the shadow. And then I was sure I was gonna feel his solid neck if he had one and I was gonna choke him. And then it knocked me out. Boom. When I woke up, bright daylight, heart was pounding, I was sweating. I don't know what just happened. <laughs> okay, now I know how to beat it. Anger. And it wasn't until my third no late twenties, early thirties, actually talking to more like minded people discovered that thing was had a name either the fourth horseman or the shadow beast if it's on fear and I go okay that's why my anger worked I soured the milk but it's not the best way to deal with it uh, they said you know love and light is strongest force in the universe so okay I was ready never love, came back for a while I love that both you and salt um both have the same philosophy and spiritual teachings around love. You know, raising your love vibration, sending the love out, even as, and especially in negative or scary circumstances, that that does shift the reality that you get to experience. Oh yeah, that, it came back, but it was in 2003. Uh, my girlfriend at the time, we were asleep in bed. I had my arm around her. And I was having a dream. And I remember this food dog, this Chinese looking food dog. And it was trying to bite my hand. So automatically I'm going, trying to pull my hand away, but I couldn't. And because I've done so much dream work, I'm going, why can't I do this? And then I looked at the Chinese food dog and I said, you, and his eyes went wide and I woke up and I saw this shadow fly right into the wall. And I said, ah, oh, you little sneak. <laughs> I don't want to swear. <laughs> but 
I says, okay, so you're back. Oh yeah, I'm ready for you now. <laughs> when, when do you think you had your first experience with UFO or alien? Oh, I don't think I was aware of it till I moved to Sedona in the 50, well, my first visit was 26 years ago, but I was just visiting. Someone told me about the energy there, so that's what would determine where I would go on vacation, check out all these high energy spots. Big Sur, Chichen Itza, New Zealand, and then in this case, I went to Sedona, went there. My first time was for a whole week. I could not sleep. I was lucky to get two or three hours of sleep a night. And when I was awake, I felt like I drank a gallon of caffeine. I don't drink coffee, but I drink tea. And I was so wired the whole week I was there. I always bring two books with me, just in case. I read both the first night. It was during the winter, so it was a long night. If you can't see the rocks, there's no reason to be out. <laughs> True. <laughs> so I'm in reading. And I had to borrow and buy more books for the rest of the week. Otherwise, I'd just be twiddling my fingers in the in my room. <laughs> waiting for daylight again uh, and well the 15 years I've lived here I've seen three spaceships close up two alien encounters one abduction one was actually a contactee experience and several Sasquatch experiences and I've taken so many pictures myself that I've gone from people that were, came on tour with me of all these orbs, strange anomalies, portals, even strange creatures. So, and a lot of lights in the sky that were not satellites or shooting stars. Yeah, actually, when you take people on the Outer Dimensions Jeep tour mm -hmm. um, at night to watch the UFOs, yes. You're the, you were my first tour guide that I got oh, to go in the Jeep with, and you had the military grade night vision goggles, yes. and we sat and watched UFOs. Mm -hmm. You were able to easily point them out and determine, mm -hmm. like, that's not a satellite, that's not space trash. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it is because uh, I use a stargazing app. It's called Stellarium. There's so many stargazing apps, you just have to find one that suits you. But well, one option I like on this one is the fact that it will identify satellites. So if there's a, a light, because after the sun goes down, the sunlight is still beaming over the atmosphere. So anything with a metallic surface will reflect light. So of course there's satellites up there. There's also UFOs up there. The thing is determining which is which. So if I see a light, if it's gonna take too much time to get my app out, boot it up, I just get my laser light, shine it, shine it. Because there's been instances where Satellite would be coming by. I put my laser light in front of, in front of its flight path, and it'll stop. It's happened a couple of times like that. And then when I take the laser light away, it goes forward again, and it's playing with my laser light. And I go, okay, that's not a satellite. Right, not a satellite. <laughs> Everybody, that's a UFO. <laughs> and then sometimes I would do it, and it'll actually dodge my laser. I put it in front, it'll dodge it again, and I go, okay. UFO, no, no mistake, but on the app that I use, I put it up, you see the moving light, tap on it. If nothing comes up, it's a UFO. But if it is a satellite, it'll say Starlink 3159, <laughs> or it'll say Cosmos, which is Russian satellites. And of course, you see Chinese characters, okay, Chinese satellite. I even, it even identified the International Space Station when it flew by, it said ISS. Wow, that's great. And Space junk, you yeah. know, stuff that, you know, when they have those rockets going off, it drops a stage or two. It'll say, rocket body. And it'll have a little symbol and emoji of a rocket body. That, that's, that's really helpful yeah, because not does. everything up there is a mm -hmm. UFO, but when you see one, mm -hmm. it's really nice to use that discernment, to have yes. something like that to give you better clarity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no. And we actually identify it easily just doing that. Yeah. It's simple. You know, you don't need fancy equipment. Well, laser light will cost you, well, depending on where you get it, it might cost you 20 bucks, might cost you 50. Hey, after the tour, I bought my own laser light. Your own laser it light. It was so yeah. cool. <laughs> really cool. I know. Yeah. The kids always say, can I hold it now? I go, no. <laughs> you could easily blind someone with that. Yeah. 
So can, tell me, can you tell me about your con contactee experience? Oh, contactee. Um, I was living in a 55 plus community. I was that old. And I felt the energy. It was strange. There was something around. I felt it at night because I was home mostly at night. And I didn't know what it was. It was new. And it went on for about two months. Of course, the person I was living with at the time, she says, oh, yeah, I felt that too. But she was there all the time. She works from home. So she says, oh, it's these aliens. They call themselves the travelers. And I go, oh, okay, that's interesting. Didn't give it much thought. So here I am going to the refrigerator for a late night snack. And it was around midnight. And I, I felt like I was being watched. So I turn, I'm looking at the kitchen window and I see an alien. And I, the energy was the same. And I go, I said it in my mind. I didn't realize it, but I said, oh, so you're the one who's been sneaking around here the last two months. One of those traveler blokes. <laughs> Well, I automatically took a step forward because without even thinking, because when we communicate verbally, you know, get closer so you can talk. Well, I didn't realize he was talking to me telepathically. I took that step forward. He goes, oh, show's over. Boom. He took off. I said, oh, where's he going? I run up to the window. I barely saw him disappear into the darkness. Those guys can run fast. Because of where he was in my kitchen window, he must have been about three, three and a half feet tall. I don't know if he was wearing something that matched his skin color or he was just butt naked. Okay. But So not a gray. Oh, it was a gray. It was a gray. Okay. But he looked gray. Yeah. And, you know, the big head, big eyes. But I believe he actually had normal features, just very small. Mm -hmm. you know, his nose, well, it wasn't as big as his eyes or his head, but it was very small. Mm -hmm. His mouth was very small and his ears were very small. Right. So I believe he was an Eben from what I've researched. Okay. Yeah, that's right. You've gotten really deep into learning the different species, the different types of breeds and mm -hmm. alien forms. Yeah. How but, many have... Oh, there's too many to mention. I mean, Just, are we talking dozens or oh no. hundreds or I mean, more like hundreds? Okay. Oh yeah. Wow. If you watch Gaia Television, G A I A, watch Galactic Messages. There's only a few seasons, but there's one episode that talks about all the extraterrestrial races in our galactic quadrant. Everything you find on the Earth is up there. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's good to know because a lot of people are only familiar with maybe one or two. Oh, yeah. You know, and and if you're going to be discerning between good and bad extraterrestrials or experiences, mm -hmm. I think it's really important for people to know how very big mm -hmm. that entire, um, you know, reality is. Mm -hmm. um, oh, they said, well, okay, Galactic Messages is actually a person... Her name is Gosia Duzak, and she's in contact with the Tigetans. The Tigetans look human just like us, but of course they're spiritually, technologically advanced. Of course their DNA is different, it's just their outward appearance is very human. You wouldn't be able to tell us the difference. So they were talking, there are 400,000 civilizations in our galactic quadrant alone. Wow. But most of them haven't even discovered fire or the wheel yet. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And the ones that are past that point are still in the Bronze Age, the Iron Age, similar to us, maybe a little bit more advanced. There's only a handful that are actually interstellar. But they were also talking about we have, well, everything you find on the Earth is up there. So we've got insectoid races, ape and simian races. We have canine races I always wondered if they were loyal and friendly <laughs> well, and there's also feline races yeah I'm familiar with those and of course we still have yeah. myths about dragons I 
there are dragons. Yes. You know, there's dragons all over the continent. You know, all the myths and legends, mm -hmm. but they're up there. Yeah. They're three stories tall and they do breathe fire, according to the Tegetans. And they said the good dragons keep the bad dragons in check. Mm -hmm. So again, that reiterates the fact that not aliens, not all aliens are good. Some are bad, some are just plain neutral. Their agendas are different, that's for sure. Um, there's also a race that the dragons are afraid of. Can you guess which one it is? No. Yeah. The felines. Is that really? Yeah. It's. Can you imagine a tiger, a lion, or a jaguar standing on two feet are telepathic and interstellar? Wow. Don't worry, they only eat synthetic meat now. <laughs> <laughs> It just reminds me because I was at the out of Africa parks oh, recently, yeah. so I can visualize that very clearly. I just saw those animals. I know. <laughs> it, it was worse for me because I was getting worried because I remember reading. I was into science fiction when I was mm -hmm. a lot younger, and I had a book series, and it was called The Man Kazin Wars. It was us against the tigers. They were like nastier than Klingons, oh, no. and they just as soon eat you than talk to you. And when I heard that, I went, Oh, okay, the universe out there is safer now. <laughs> <laughs> so um, thank you for sharing that experience. And also, you were talking to me earlier about the Super Soldier Program. Can you go into that and yes. maybe start with, for those that are new here that are not familiar with this content, mm -hmm. can you kind of give like an overview what that is? Oh, well, there's so much involved. Uh it begins with the fact that we didn't really win World War II. Now we refer to them as the Mars Germans. It's them and the Cabal and the Dracos. The only reason why they haven't gotten their way with us is because the other aliens won't let them do it. So we also have protectors in a way. Uh, super soldier program well part of it is we get selected to serve as soldiers I know there's a 20 40 even a 60 year program now I was probably part of the first the ending of the first generation or the beginning of the second they're up to the fifth or sixth generation of super soldiers right now and I know they're definitely well, they lie to you while you're in service. They tell you you're going to get paid, you're going to get, you know, all these benefits. And what really happens is they just mind wipe all your memories for your time in service. Regress your age, hopefully it goes okay, and then put you back where they found you. If it was 20 years ago, they put you back 20 years in the past. 40 years, 60 years. But that regression of age doesn't really work completely. So that's why we have a lot of young people who, who act like they're 60 or 80 years old. It's that regression didn't really take hold. How would somebody know if they were a super soldier? What would some of the signs be? Oh, it's like PTSD, but they don't know where it's from. That's the worst part is not knowing, you know, you're something will trigger you, something that happened to you in the service. And of course, doctors just attribute it to, because a lot of these people also serve in the military. So they give it, oh, you just have PTSD, but it goes much deeper than that. And they are whatever you're susceptible to. If you're susceptible to alcohol or gambling or whatever it is, they increase that. To you were saying that at a certain age? Yeah. Well, I know the more recent generations, they'll actually program to self-terminate before they're 45. Okay. Yeah, this is in the book by James Rink called Lone Wolf. And it's an accumulation of all his interviews and also his personal experience with it. Now, he gave me some uh, regression and I found out more details about the, I only have very small snippets of what happened to me. And 
when I thought that they invaded my bedroom and injected me in the arm. I believe they put an implant in there. Of course, I don't have insurance for alien implants. So. <laughs> Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> Maybe we can work on that. Yeah. Um, oh, I believe I have one in my leg, too. That was from the military. And that's what this regression did. It helped me get more uh, complete memories of what actually happened. And when I thought they came into my bedroom and did this, what actually happened was, no, well, they just le levitated me off the bed and I went through a portal in my wall. And immediately I was in a medical facility. It looked like a, a medical room. There was an alien there and several humans. Now the alien was very different from the one that I had contact experience with. This one was also small, gray, big head, big eyes, no physical features. I believe it had two holes for nose, one hole for each ear, still a small mouth. And I believe this one was, oh, I call it from the grays from Reticulus, Zeta Reticuli. I don't even remember the planet, sorry. But they're more like cybernetic organisms. They're like walking avatars. They just stick their consciousness in or the consciousness somehow controls the body from a different area. And it's doing things. And I could ask questions right there, like, who are you working for? They're just doing their job. There is no exact identity for who's controlling this operation. And I believe they covered themselves by doing that. So if anybody had the ability I had, me and James Rink together, we're not going to learn much. And all I got was they're just doing their jobs. Okay. So I'm part of either a tracking system. Yeah. They get samples, get readings. Okay, put them back. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not supposed to remember, but I do. Okay. Because when they were injecting it into my arm, that's when I woke up. And I fought them because I moved. And my nerves hurt for three to six months. And I even recognized the wound when I was conscious again the next day because I go, well, something's not right. And I went like this. I looked at my hand and there was blood on it. I go, wow. I looked at my shoulder. I saw the blood dripping from a wound. And I squeezed it. And it was a nice... It was... You could tell it was almost surgical in nature because it was such a clean cut. And when I squeeze it, it opened up and I go, I've seen this before. When I was in the military, they gave us injections with air guns because during that was part of basic training. They had to inoculate us with I don't know how many things. But it must have had about six or eight shots, all with air guns. And I saw the guys who moved. They're like big gauze on their shoulder and they're in pain. And they were in pain for a long time. The whole time we were at uh, our basic training. Yeah. <laughs> So because same kind moved. of thing. Yeah. So I know. I says, oh, that rem it, I immediately knew it was from that. So they injected me with something. Uh, I think it's more of an implant. That's what I found out from James Rink's session, a session with him. It's an implant. And also, when I was in the service, I tore my chest muscle clean off the bone. And it was only the f 14th case in the Air Force to have an injury like that. And they took a piece of my leg to put it up here. And then they put mesh later to go over it because I had a graft taken off in my the fascia lata, which covers the muscle. So there's nothing holding my muscle. So when I came out, I had this big old bunch of my leg. And I go, are you guys going to fix this? They go, oh, that's aesthetic. We don't do plastic surgery. Unless you start to go be in pain and then we'll do it. So a month later I came in, I went, ow, 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 it hurts. Can you fix it? <laughs> so they did and they asked me, you want a piece of cadaver or you want mesh, artificial mesh? I go, I've watched too many horror B movies. So I go, no, I don't, I'll take the mesh. Yeah, cadaver. And I found out later that with James Rink that there's also an implant in there. Okay. So. We'll talk a little bit more about that, too, because uh, part of my spiritual work is mm. inactivating um, or disintegrating implants. Well, 
we need to do this. Yes. <laughs> yes. We have yes. To figure out how am I going to get rid of it. I don't have insurance yes. to have it physically removed. So. Yeah. yeah. So, um, okay, so we'll be talking about that. Yeah, we'll definitely talk more about that. Yeah. Okay. We've got two implants for him. Yes. All the things they're doing, you know, they do mention it in Guy, a cosmic disclosure. Okay. They're up to 25 seasons, so I couldn't name the season in a specific yeah. episode. If you watch it, they do talk about they have several guests that are in the Super Soldier program, and even uh, a guy who was in the Marine Corps. And he was a captain. He was head of special operations. There was another Marine guy, too. His name was, I believe, Randy Rodriguez. I think he he does the UFO convention circuit. Okay. And uh, I'm not sure about the other guy who was the captain in the Marine Corps in charge of special operations. And they talk about fighting the Dracos. Okay. Well... Do you want to do you want to mention something like that? Oh yeah, all you okay. know, between the book and cosmic disclosure, you'll get a pretty good picture of what's going on. If people wanted to know more about the Super Soldier program, get more information about that, more background knowledge, what would be a reputable source? Where could they go to learn more about that? Oh, you know, everybody has information that you can piece together and get a good picture. And for me, it was just watching Gaia television and they have a show called Cosmic Disclosure. You have hosts like George Nori, you know, everybody, a lot of people know George Nori. And sometimes he'll host some of the episodes. Uh, David Wilcox, George Nori, a guy named Ray Wiedner. Um, and even one of their guests ended up being one of the hosts. His name was Emery Smith. And he, he had quite a background too because he actually worked in the medical field, in the military, and worked in the secret programs they had going. He would take a lot of samples, and he knew these samples were not from Earth. You know, it would be tissues. Was it an alien plant or just alien? And then later on, they would, you know, as they built up his trust, so they let him in on the many other projects they're involved in. Everything is so compartmentalized that you don't know, you know, you got like an octopus, you know, this part doesn't know what this part's doing. And this part, and this part, and this part, they all don't know, but it all goes somewhere. Right, and you mentioned some people that are on the circuit, the UFO Expo circuit. Oh yeah, James Rink was part of it. And, okay, you know, Kim actually was there. I couldn't. I was working at the time. It was a three day, yeah, three, three day thing. And one day I had to work, and that's when Jim Rink was there. So she made it a point to go and talk to him because she knew about all the stuff I've been involved in, and all my injuries weren't what they were. And she knew she had to talk to him and she got us together. I talked to him, we set up an appointment, he regressed me and I got all more details of that one, two experiences. Okay. You know, when they put the implant in my leg, I went there and talked to the doctors and you know, they're just doing their job. So the mesh in there actually had an implant in it. Okay. And I've got a side question because people that I've worked with that have implants, mm. they tend to get embedded with subconscious programming and broadcasting, mm -hmm. um, making you feel that it's beneficial for you to keep so that you don't want to have it removed. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like yours broadcasts anything like that to you? Oh, yeah, it does. You know, because I'll want to remove it and then I'll go through long periods of not even thinking about it. And I go, that's not like me. I'll write things down. <laughs> yeah. I have a list and it's like, oh, I haven't written it down. That's okay. So I find, I found that strange. Okay. Yeah. Cause when you know yourself, you go, wait a minute. I always write things down. I don't write this down. Why? Yeah, but you know, when I do bring it out, oh, I remember, yes, I want to get it out. What can I do? Where can I go? Who do I talk to? Right. So okay. That's probably why I'm here. Yes. Don't let me forget. Yes. <laughs> no, we won't. Yeah. Don't let me forget. Not, not next time. <laughs> Remember, you said you were going to get this yeah. taken out. I, oh, yeah. Mind wipe. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, 
So tell us what you do um, when people come and see you, for instance, on the Outer Dimensions tour. You teach them how what to look for in the sky, in the night yes. sky, and how to spot UFOs, and you have the military night vision goggles. Yeah. And we'll put information for the tours below here so they know that they can call there and contact you and ask for a private Jeep tour. Oh, yes. Um, but what else do you do on those tours? You said you, meant, you mentioned that you do like a drum clearing. Oh, yeah. Well, those are for the Vortex tours. The Vortex yeah. tours. Okay. Kim will do Same company, it. but yeah, same a different company, tour. Different tour, yes. Yeah, for the Vortex tours, you know, people want to learn about what is this Vortex stuff? I keep hearing it. Don't know much about it, so can you tell us about it? Oh, yeah, I came to the right place. This is a Vortex tour. And I tell them that I do have a background of the spiritual practices of the indigenous people and I also tell them I can explain the western science side of things and put it together so that they have a better understanding of it you know I usually give detailed examples like when I tell them about the energy when I talk about energy I'm talking about the electromagnetic energy of the earth and I'm also talking about the electromagnetic energy in our bodies and of course there are people who can see this energy and the rest of us cannot we do have the scientific equipment to prove that it's there. So I wish I brought my little science toy with me. You know, you touch one end, complete the circuit, touch the other end, and it lights up and makes noise. Yeah, I was doing that at, at the know. resort. Uh, yeah, <laughs> we so were funny. just playing with yes. it. It's all grown adults. Yes, wow. yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll bring it out. You don't have to be kids. Just childlike. It's and, great. Yeah. And um, well, everybody does have the ability. Mm -hmm. It's just that we in the Western world are not brought up that way. We're taught to disbelieve it, discredit it, and at best ignore it. And uh, well, government's known about it a long time. They used to recruit Indians for our scout and reconnaissance units. Mm -hmm. I think I told that story to you too. Yeah. Yeah. And during the Vietnam War, after disastrous results, they found out that when they put these recruits to military training and cut their hair, they lost their other abilities, just like Samson and Delilah. So from that point on, they could keep their long hair. Yes. Um, like an antenna, right? Yeah. Like a, That's a how psychic the antenna. Say, yeah. Mm -hmm. They says, well, ever since I cut my hair, I don't, I'm not as sensitive as I used to be. Mm -hmm. And that's what got them in a lot of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> of course, now we don't have the government recruiting Indians specifically for our scout and reconnaissance units anymore because now we have our Navy SEALs. Now we have a retired Navy SEAL instructor. His name is Michael J Jaco. He has a book, Intuitive Warrior, and a podcast. And because that's what's so good. Everybody has a podcast. We put it all together and you know, there's help for everyone here. Yes. Is just find out who these people are, check it out. And of course, I have my own circle of information because of my experiences. And uh, Michael Jaco, in his book, Intuitive Warrior, he talks about what he did during his time in Iraq. Now, these guys trained to increase their intuition, but that always leads to other things. Michael Jaco, he used to shuttle VIPs from one safe zone to the next in Iraq. On this particular day, they had just left the safe zone and he just got hit with an impending feeling of doom. He knew if he didn't do anything in the next few seconds, people were gonna die. So what he did was he put out a shield of fierce and fearless love as far and as strong as he could. And that feeling slowly faded and they made it to the next safe zone unscathed. Unfortunately, the second group that came out was attacked immediately. That attack was meant for them. Wow. And it was funny, He when I read about it, it says, oh, he's using the shield. Mm -hmm. fierce, he called it fierce and fearless love. I just said love. I go, I like that. I'll use it. Yeah, that's where you got fierce that. Fierce and fearless love. <laughs> I like it. Yeah, but I've been doing it for so long. Yeah. And I keep coming I like across the all these experiences where people are using the same thing. You know, some people say, you know, well, why do I need a shield? I said, well, let's see. Low on a totem pole. <laughs> Everybody knows someone who likes to get into your personal space and just suck the energy right out of you. Some people call them energy vampires. Shield's good for that. It's also good for thwarting terrorist attacks, bad aliens, skinwalkers. <laughs> it works all the way around. Virus, bacteria. Ah, yes. All things. <laughs> I, it's very interesting what a multi 
dimensional and spiritual and physical. It's all mixed together, but it really does. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like we were talking about earlier when you take all the different indigenous cultures and religions or spirituality mm -hmm. and you strip them of their specific beliefs, you find oh, yeah. commonalities and truths. Oh, yeah. Same thing. I think when we're talking about working with demons, aliens, mm -hmm. virus, bacteria, whatever, yeah. Yeah. it's all, it's like once you get the rules and you understand that love transmutes everything and that's yeah. the most powerful weapon, yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, that it actually is the same vibration that can be used to heal on all, all levels. Mm -hmm. You know, one thing I, I remember something Emery said, Emery Smith on Cosmic Disclosure when he was a, a guest. Because he worked with the aliens, you know, doing samples and tests. And he talked about all the different aliens. He said, and one thing that you learn when you're working with aliens. Now, they've been telepathic for millennia. So if you come in and you're emotional about something, you had a bad day, your girlfriend just broke up with you, you know, your dog died. If you say hi to them, they'll feel the emotions. So if you say, he said one, they called George because he can't pronounce their names. <laughs> yeah. And even if they did, they can't. Like a lot of mentally sounds. Mentally telepathic, yeah. mm -hmm. they say their names. And if you say, they call him George. So he goes, hi, George. But because of he didn't clear himself, there's something bothered him. They hear it as, hi, George. <laughs> they, yes. they pick up a lot. And they know exactly who they are when you make eye contact with them. They know all about you and you feel it. Mm -hmm. So one thing I do say in my Outer Dimension tours is think about having 150 questions to ask if you ever come across an alien. Because even uh, another guy, Michael Higgins, who had so many contacting experiences, he does UFO tours too, you know, when he's trying to ask him a simple telepathic question like, hi, what's your name? Their response is like war and peace. You get all that information all in one sending. Okay. So we're low on the total pole when it comes to the telepathic abilities. Yeah. We do that in the outer dimension tours too. We, we use a technique that we got from the E SETI and C SETI groups, but we only want the good ones. So we give them a telepathic message. We, you remember this one? Uh, I think I did it with you and your group where it's like using Google Earth. We start, we see ourselves at Bradshaw Point. And then as we zoom upward, we see more of the area where we're at. First we see Bradshaw Point, then we see Sedona, then we keep going higher. You see North America, and then finally the Earth. And then we zoom back down to exactly where we are. And this lets them know, it doesn't matter how far they are or which dimension they're in, they'll read it. Because, well, even quantum physicists say we exist in 10 dimensions. Mm -hmm. Most people are only aware of the first four. And we don't have the scientific equipment for the other six, but they also know that there's an infinite number of dimensions to right. explore. Where the spiritual practices of the indigenous people also know there's an infinite number of dimensions to explore and that's where they finally match in description. The only difference is quantum physicists have only known this for the last 100 years or so. Spiritual practices, 30,000. Right. You want to share one of the quantum experiences that you've had on tour? Oh, yeah. Kim already told, oh, salt. No. Not, not in this. Not in this one? Mm -mm. Four Jeeps involved. She's driving one. There's a guy named Lenny driving the second, Pierce driving the third, and I was driving the fourth. Now, she and Lenny were at Bradshaw Point. Dun, dun, dun. Bradshaw Point again, right? Yes. Everything happens on the Bradshaw Point. common denominator. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, she left first. And not even a mile away. The Jeep just quits. Just like all the electricity said, we're out of here. Poof, gone. She couldn't get it started again. Now, she knew Lenny was right behind her. Uh, but we're going to fast forward on the Jeep. Next day, mechanics found nothing wrong with it. Back to the day it broke down. Well, she knew Lenny was next. Then she saw a Jeep coming down. Okay, here's Lenny now. No problem. Put her passenger with Lenny. She'll go back and wait for the 
Well, no, she was going to wait for the mechanics. That's what happened. So when the Jeep got closer, she noticed it wasn't Lenny. It was Pierce. And of course, that made her curious. When Pierce got up to where she was at, she asked him, Pierce, where are you driving from? He says, Bradshaw Point. Bradshaw Point isn't that big. If you're there, you'll see everybody else is there. And Kim said, well, I was there. I didn't see you. Did you see me? And Pierce said, no. And then Lenny shows up. So she asked Lenny, Lenny, did you see Pierce up there at Bradshaw Point? Lenny goes, no. Pierce, did you see Lenny? And he said, no, you guys are starting to freak me out. And then, of course, I show up. And I tell Kim, hey, I heard you broke down over the radio. You need any help? She looks at me, oh, we got that part covered. Then she looked at me funny, put her hands on her hips, and she goes, where are you driving from? And I said, I was on Bradshaw Point. I had the whole place to myself. <laughs> so four Jeeps, yeah. including our passengers, but only two of the four saw each other. Wow. We obviously occupied the same space at the same time. If her Jeep never broke down, we would not have known anything was out of the ordinary. But now that it happened the way it did, we all can't help but ask, how many times has this happened that we didn't know? Right. Yeah, so all the story gets even more interesting. I have to be careful why would I say this, but Kim has another tour. This time, it was only a week later. She has a quantum physicist on board. This guy works for one of those big airplane companies. I don't want to say which one. And he works only with military contracts. So this guy has to be at the top of his class. And of course, because of everything we've been in for, we're kind of facetious. So Kim asks, so what can you tell me about what you do there? He goes, I can't tell you anything. <laughs> then she goes, okay, I tell you what, I'll tell you a story. You tell me what you think. So she tells him about the four Jeeps. And this is what he said. He goes, oh, we call that quantum entanglement. We're studying it right now. We're trying to incorporate it in all, a lot of the projects we got going. And you just spilled the beans. You just have to know how to ask. <laughs> yeah. Right. So. And that's a real thing. Yeah, that's a real thing. You know, and I've had, I've talked to people that have had similar situations in different areas of the world, mm -hmm. but the amount of times and the, fr the frequency and the scale that it happens here in Sedona mm -hmm. is, I believe, unmatched. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, just the things I've experienced in the last 15 years. Then you talk to other people and they tell you theirs. And it's like, oh, this is a hotbed. Mm -hmm. You know, I've traveled a little bit here and there, but stuff that happens here. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, oh, there's even a Mandela effect. That's right. Let's oh, talk yeah. about that. No, I would. Oh, I was do this is when I first got here. I was doing... Uh, a tour that I did almost every day that I was working and part of it is looking at the graffiti on the wall and there's a date on it it was 9 6 27 so you do this tour every day for like almost a year and then one day I went up there after not being there for about a month and we go up there oh let me show you this of you know and then I looked at, and look at the date it says 9 6 25 and I go Wait a minute, it was 27 all this time, now it's 25. And I'm going, it doesn't look like, you know, I shine the light at it just so I could see it more clearly. And I go, no, it's 25. And it doesn't look like someone went up there and just changed it. Right. You know, this stuff is engraved in yeah. the rock. Yeah, so. So what is that about, you think? Oh, they have something called the Mandela effect because Nelson Mandela, South Africa, now, Supposedly, some people remember him dying in prison. The rest of us say, no, he got out of prison, became president of the country, and just died of old age later. But these people say, no, 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 he died in prison. So now it's called the Mandela Effect. So I I asked everybody else, what do you remember? Do you show the graffiti? What, you, what day? You know, and some, you know, I talked to White Wolf Nate. Now he said, yeah, it's 27. And we go, yeah, it's 27, but it's 25. Go up there right now, see if it's still 25. And 
after a, a short period, went up there again, it went back to 27. Oh, interesting. It did went go back. back. To, it went back, yes. Okay. And for what you see and read, especially on Cosmic Disclosure, there is a main timeline. There's so many fingers in the pot that want to change it this way, mm -hmm. there's it this way, and some are just trying to keep it, the timeline on the right timeline. I don't know what that means, but I guess it's the right timeline is the one that's more beneficial for us. Not just as humans on the earth, but the earth itself. Right. So there's, there's so many aliens with certain agendas, so that's why the timeline kind of wavers mm -hmm. and then finally solidifies. Even our remote viewers, like Tom Dongo explained it, you can go into the past, the past has already happened, so you only see one image. But if he looks into the future, the future keeps changing. Mm -hmm. He looks into the future, and even that looking into the future will change, make it change. So if you go five years, 10 years in the future, in QHHT, the hypnosis technique, they don't like to do that because what if you're not there? You you died. <laughs> That's like letting you know you ain't gonna make it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So she doesn't like to do that. But those who are okay with it, you know, they look ahead. But she also says that it keeps changing. Mm -hmm. you know, the future is not set. It can go any way, which any way but loose. Yes. Or every every which way loose. The Clint Eastwood movie, old one. The orangutan <laughs> again that dates me okay um, <laughs> yeah yeah I mean that's a lot of things I mean time is a whole nother topic that we could go on and on and on about oh yeah I remember the book time is an illusion I read it many many years ago I think when I was pregnant with my daughter mm -hmm. um, but it is it's an illusion and all my spiritual work has verified that to me mm -hmm. you know we can slow it down we can speed it up we can go to other places, we can visit past lives, future lives. Mm -hmm. um, there's so, we exist in all of them. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's quite amazing. So. Oh yeah. Hmm. It's, but I think it's fun to play with here. It, it feels like the environment is so <laughs> playful back. Mm -hmm. It makes it easier to, uh, to, to work with time and mm -hmm. actually all the other universal laws mm -hmm. as well here. You know, they're not so strapped down and solid. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, when I was in San Diego, you know, you're caught in traffic all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, not a good thing, but because I was on the road so much, I saw alternate realities all the time. I would see what would happen if I didn't do what I did, just a few seconds apart. And uh, I would be, well, just gone into the next lane. And then all of a sudden I got a quick flash of what would happen if I didn't do it. I would have been in a bad accident. And I went, okay, mental note, file it for future reference. And I noticed there were several instances, the same thing would happen. And when I was in an accident, there's several times where things would just slow down. And then there was a place where the, there were traffic lights all in a row. And they always didn't change at the right time. And I didn't realize that I was looking at the wrong traffic light. It was green, but the one in front of me was red. I went right through. And I saw this car coming. I went. <laughs> and all of a sudden, time slowed down. And I angled it just right, speeded up, and we just missed each other. And... I can't even imagine what would have happened. This was different than seeing the alternate reality playing out, but this time I altered my right. own reality. And there was another accident I was also part of where when you hit traffic, you know, everybody stopped in front of you. It's a wall of stalled cars. And here I come. Okay, I'm slowing down. And I look at my rear view mirror and I see this other car just zooming in, went right past me, and I went, uh oh. And sure enough, smash into another car, and this is happening right in front of me again. Time slowed down, and I turned just right to avoid the car. The van hit, and then the van came back at me, <laughs> and I went around, pulled.
pulled off to the side and just saw the rest of it play out. It was a multi-car crash and it was like, oh, well. Yeah, so you navigated that timeline. like, And isn't there some kind of weird awareness when that's happening? It's like you have an awareness like, oh, is this really happening? Am I supposed to be a part of it? But then you're not. You're not being physically affected by what's happening around you, whether that was written into your timeline or not. Yeah. Something is like there's an awareness that it's changed and you mm-hmm. come out unscathed. Yeah. What do you think that's about? Well, in that same instance, yeah. though, I could actually, it's almost as I felt or saw this giant hand just push my car out of oh. the way. So Some kind of spiritual assistance. Mm-hmm. Oh, and that's what I wanted to talk to you about, too. So you have a soul spirit animal. Well, yes. Um, when I oh, I decided to take a class, and it said um, shamanic practices. And what she did do was she did an introduction to our soul spirit animal which was very different from other animals. You have spirit animals, power animals, totem animals. You know, they're like friends. They come for a reason, a season, or throughout your life for whatever problem you have. Mm-hmm. But with a soul spirit animal, it's different. It's like one of your guides and teachers. You know, everyone has about maybe a dozen of these helpers, you know, guardian angels, mm-hmm. teachers and guides. And the soul spirit animal is one of them. It shows up, the interest in animal spirit shows up on the day of your birth and stays with you through your whole life. And uh, it's kind of funny because when people are introduced to it, it's funny how they get it because some people have an idea what it might be. No one's ever guessed it right. I've done this over 20 years. They <laughs> always guess it wrong. The closest anyone came to is this guy. He goes, I know what mine is. It's an eagle. And then when I did the session, I says, well, here's your soul spirit animal. It's a pigeon. He's He was the closest because it still had wings. Right. He thought it was an eagle. No, it's a pigeon. Right. How did you feel about that? Oh, what a letdown. Oh, he was so disappointed. He kept asking, are you sure it is? I, yes. Yes. Talk to it. It'll tell you why it's here. Uh, so what is, can you tell me what the difference is between a soul spirit animal and a totem animal? Or um, Well, it's just the others are like friends. Okay. That's my best description. Okay. They show up yeah. for a reason, a season or a lifetime. But the soul spirit animal is there for your whole life. It's meant to well it's like a guardian angel okay yeah um would that be similar to like a familiar you know in wicca Wicca. they have a familiar where they're just like they feel super bonded and yeah they're bonded yes they're bonded and if something happens to your familiar it will affect you yes because your connection with you okay is so strong okay yeah and um can't think of it. Sometimes I think of D and D too because I used to play it. <laughs> oh, what am I kidding? I would still if I had people <laughs> to do it with me. Um, yeah, I'm a nerd. <laughs> but the thing is, the game itself helped me to get into this too. Okay. Because you know, my character was a, a fighter cleric, okay. spiritual, spiritual warrior. Yeah. And. Uh, I was a massage therapist at the time too, so I go, oh, can I give them some abilities, you know, with massage? So I help to heal them. They get extra points back if I give them a massage. Okay. <laughs> so in a way, this is making me more, it, it got me more into the metaphysical side of things. Mm. Things were happening, but I wasn't thinking that way yet. Interesting. Yeah, I, th- I felt it more of an individual ability. I knew it wasn't me, I was a conduit, but that's as far as it went. And then when I got into this, it made me go into the metaphysical even more. Okay. You know, because it was interesting and you play with it. I said, would it be good if I could do that in real life? And I go, oh, in a way I am. Okay, now I'm doing more. You mean the game? The game, Okay, yeah, Yeah, because everything is actually created in the mind. So if you're in a stunning reality of creation where you can do those things, you're actually programming your mind to be able to do those things. Yeah. That is like a, a real, real world way yeah. Yeah. to actually develop a real world application. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, because every that, that's what makes man different. If yeah. we can think it mm-hmm. and visualize it in our mind, we can do it and be it. Mm-hmm. And so that's a an avenue, actually. And my oh, some of my best instances or experiences was just that. I have a thought. Mm-hmm. I go, oh wait. Let's test it out. 
I was shopping with my girlfriend. You know, it's like, oh, I'm tired. I don't want to do this. She wants to go to another store. So I, uh, you go in, I'll wait out here. And I was sitting on the bench right across from the store she was going into. It's a mall. And I had this random thought. Can I make myself disappear? I go, oh, that'd be fun. So I did that. She came out. And I did like, I tried to do like a Jedi mind trick when she was looking directly at me. I says, no, that's not gonna work. Uh, I made sure I was in her mind, looking through her eyes and made sure that I was not in the picture. If she saw the bench I was sitting on, it'd be empty. But if she concentrated long enough, she might see me. So I would do this, like throwing a rock, physically like throwing a rock, but it's a mental rock. I go like that. And then she looked that way. I says, ooh, it worked. Let's try it this way. And she looked at, back at me again. I went through the rock on the other side and she looked over there. And I go, ooh, this is fun. She looked at me again and I just concentrated more and just envisioning an empty bench where I was sitting on. And she was looking at me, looking at me. She was wondering where I was. She was a little <laughs> teed off. I says, well, I better get over there. <laughs> so I'm walking up to her and she still doesn't see me. And then I started the worries. Oh, shoot, I disappeared and I can't get back. I go, oh no. And I finally got to where I was just a foot away from her. And I startled her. She goes, where did you come from? I'm right in front of you. She said, no, you weren't. I says, no, I was sitting on the bench over there. She looks at the bench, no, you weren't. I looked over there, you weren't there. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I finally explained it to her. And I wasn't able to do it again. Yeah. Because she knew what I could do. Right. And she goes, sometimes she'll warn me. She says, don't you try to disappear on me again. I don't know it. <laughs> it won't work. But she was right. It didn't work. <laughs> I shouldn't have told her. <laughs> I believe everything is created in our mind and there's certain rules and, and energies at play. Mm -hmm. But I, I feel like... Um, I feel that we're here to have a physical world or to live a first physical experience, but to remember how powerful we are and and that we can tap into all our spiritual gifts and to play with them here. Mm -hmm. Because once we're dead and we're in spirit, we can do everything anyway. Mm -hmm. But I think the fun is doing it here when we're physical and we have to relearn or use it differently mm -hmm. to um, access who we really are. Mm -hmm. But isn't it fun? I, I love it. Oh, yeah, it is. <laughs> and uh, of course I have these people, this sort of one end of the spectrum where if I talk about this, and they go, only Jesus Christ can do that. And I'm going, okay, well, I can tell you this much. The Bible does mention the things that we do like this, and it says these are gifts of God. I just remember, I just don't remember the exact verse. Mm -hmm. So, and I don't know if it's one version of the Bible or the other version. <laughs> yeah. Well, Jesus said we would do more than he would. Yeah. I need better memory. <laughs> More coconut oil. <laughs> no, really, the Mayo Clinic will use coconut oil as part of the Alzheimer's protocols. And you get organic, virgin coconut oil. Take a teaspoon three times a day, and then you can lessen the dose as you do it more often. And they notice the Alzheimer's patients get their memories back mm. and they're normal again. It's part of the Mayo Clinic's treatment plan. That's, that's awesome. Yeah. Another thing that is good for that is um, organic blueberries, they have to be grown in Maine, the state of Maine. In Maine only? Mm -hmm. Maine blueberries. It's a specific blueberry that only grows there, mm -hmm. and it pulls heavy metals and everything out of your brain. Uh, mm -hmm. So a smoothie. Oh, out of the brain. Yeah, out of okay. the brain. So I know brain... cilantro will take metals out of your body. Mm -hmm. It will pull it out of your brain so your brain can heal from that. Yeah, like a smoothie every day with a big cup of blueberry. organic Maine blueberries. blueberries. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Little sprig of See, you never know what people are going to learn here. <laughs> yeah, you never know. One leads well, to another. Yeah. If you were going to do like, so you you do that. You offer that to people, right? You tell them who their, their oh, yes. um, soul, spirit, animal is. Yes, you do like a private a, session with people. Yeah, it's a simple guided meditation that I'll put myself on if it's one-on-one. -on -one. But if I'm doing a large group, the last one I did, I had about, I had 18, but before that it was 25. Wow. 
So I do groups. When I do that, well, I'm not going to do one for everybody. So I pair them off. This is how I learned in class, too. Right. Pair them off. They find each other's. Okay. You never find your own. Too much ego, ego involved. Yeah. And we in the Western world tend to glamorize the animals. Yeah. If I gave you a choice to choose between a black panther and a turkey vulture, which one would you pick? Well, I would actually. Yeah. Oh, you're case, more involved than most no, people. No, no, no. Sorry, not because of question. that. I actually think tur turkey vultures are pretty cool. <laughs> no, then you'd be in the small percentage of people that actually raise their hand when I ask that. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, no, I get it though. Yeah. Um, but so you do that. So people they go on tour with you, and they can book private sessions with you to do that, or they can well, pay you to come in and work with a group if they have a group gathering, oh, like yeah. maybe even a corporate event. You can yes. come in and do something. Corporate events. Yeah, that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. And you do speaking. You do public speaking, and you'll be starting your podcast oh, with yeah. Saul, mm -hmm. which is called I, Beyond the Meat Suit. <laughs> that's right. With Salt and Firefox. Yeah. Or Kim and Alex. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, that's going to be fantastic. And you guys are going to cover so much and go even into more depth than we did here today mm -hmm. on all of these topics. Oh, yeah. Oh, there's, there's so much to talk about. There is. You know? It's endless. When people want to follow you, Firefox, how should they get a hold of you? Same links like through the, the yeah, main same website? Link, the main website. We'll uh, put that down below this yeah. video. So that'll be um, beyondthemeatsuit.com, mm -hmm. which hops them over to Kim W. Salt. Mm -hmm. And there you have a link for the podcast to sign up for the, oh, for, yes. to get on the email list mm -hmm. um, so that if anything gets taken down mm -hmm. through, uh, you know, whatever agency <laughs> that they can, oh, yeah. they can still All have the email. Alphabet. Yeah. Yeah. People yeah. can still find you and you can reach them. Mm hmm and they can send you questions, right? You'll, you'll, oh, yeah, I can answer. I'm sure you'll cover so many of the topics that people have questions for. So mm -hmm. if they want to start sending those in, they don't have to wait. Um, as you're preparing for the podcast, you can start to, to get those questions oh, yeah. incorporated into your content. Oh, yeah. And, you know, we do offer a lot of services. If you happen to just come on one of our tours with Rainbow Adventures, also known as Sedona Jeep Tours. And uh, we had people actually make custom tours. I just did one yesterday. He wanted a Vortex tour, but he wanted a four and a half hour custom tour, Vortex oriented. And uh, all our tours for the Vortex uh, tours are all about two hours. This was four and a half. Okay, so, so that's nice to know. we, you know, I said, yeah, I can do that. So we did it. Okay, great. So they can actually just call and, and, you know, if they have different special things that they want to experience, mm -hmm. you can work that out with them and make more of a custom Jeep yeah. tour experience. Yeah. It might have to go through um, Lisa. She'll handle all the special events. Yeah. So if the reservations believe they need to do that, they will. Okay. <laughs> Otherwise, they'll just say, yeah, we can do that. Go get Firefox. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. You guys, I want to thank you so much for being here. It was such a pleasure to have Alex, a.k.a. Firefox, here. Right? And to... Yeah, thank you. It was a pleasure being here, too. Yeah, thank yeah. you. When I'm hearing him and Salt talk, you know, we've all become friends. And every time we have conversation, it's like almost looking in a mirror. And it's like, oh, my God, I had that. Or, oh, my God, you know. And it's like all these likenesses that just come flooding back. Mm -hmm. And it's like so much of your life, if you're, if you've been on this path, mm -hmm. on this journey, like you were sharing earlier, like who are you going to tell? Because nobody else is having it. Nobody mm -hmm. else is experiencing it or maybe not to the level that you are. Mm -hmm. So much of your life, if you've been doing this work, you may have felt like you didn't have people to reach out to or share your, your experiences with, especially in the spiritual psychic realm with ufos aliens bigfoot all the stuff that like most people think is kind of you know fringe it's mm -hmm. it's not accepted by the mainstream so you guys if you're any of those people you're so welcome here on my channel and you have to follow them on their podcast and be part of their tribe and you're, you're going to just find so many other like-minded people and really really valuable content you shared a lot of good um, information and contact even for other people. It's kind of like it unravels like a spider web. Like, oh, you know, you share information and it's like, then this book, then this website, then this person. Yeah, I noticed that, you know, when you're with a lot of like-minded people, there's so much to share mm -hmm. and so much to learn from. Yes. Even when I do these tours of people who may have a lot of experience or no experience, it's 
it's still a learning experience for me because yeah. I'll take in what they're learning, what they're experiencing, what they have to tell me, and that changes things. And then I incorporate it in everything else I yeah. teach and know about and share it with everyone in yeah. hopes to get it more universal. Yeah, absolutely. And and that being said, it's always the nature of it still evolving too, right? Mm -hmm. Like you learn something and you kind of master it and you teach it and then you watch it and then you're like, one day you're like, oh, weird, the results are shifting. Yeah. And you're like, we've and something has leveled out and now mm -hmm. the rules are like changing a little bit or accelerating. Um, so that's kind of funny too. And I think that that's how we, we all grow together as a collective. Yeah. yeah, how we continue to evolve, so. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're all doing here. Mm -hmm. right. See, we think alike. We wore the same color. I, I know. We, we got little, almost like little matchy yeah, necklaces on on a black cord. That's so funny. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't plan this. I know. We didn't. You just called me. You coming over today? Yeah. I know, right? Right now. Yeah. You guys. So I, I'm just so thrilled that you guys were here today to talk to Alex, aka Firefox. Please reach out to him. Put comments down below this video. Um, ask us your questions. And again, I will share all his links so that you can connect with him directly. Follow him and Salt. Definitely follow their podcast when that gets up and live. Come out to Sedona, go on any of the tours, the Jeep tours, schedule some custom ones and, and get a soul spirit animal reading from Alex. I'm actually very curious about what mine is. Oh. Yeah, I never really like understood when you were talking about it, mm -hmm. the differences between the totem animals and the power messenger animals, animals yeah. and power animals and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. very cool. Oh, yeah. Very cool. Infinite diversity and infinite combinations. Yeah. Yeah. I learned that from Star Trek. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Everybody tells me, well, what happens if this, you know, they think that it's so separate. Right. No, no, it's, it, it all works. Mm -hmm. there's, there's a reason. And so the best way to explain it is that one phrase. Yeah. Just expect it, you know, to happen differently, different combinations. True. Yeah. There is no one steadfast rule for everything. No, that's true. And even working with different people, everyone experiences it different. Mm -hmm. Um, whether, you know, if two people get together to do work and they perceive things different because their unique combination or vibration creates its own unique vibration, you know, that's shared. So the shared experience is different based on who you're with or talking to or uh, even receiving healing from somebody that all changes as well. Mm -hmm. So, very cool. Well, I like the music, hug. Yeah. <laughs> thank you for being on. Yeah. Okay, you guys. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day.